Hi, I'm Mark Royce, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. Well, what a pleasure to have my good friend Mark Royce on the program. It's, it's been too long, too long coming, and, and it's been a long time since I've seen you, but thank you for joining Cars and Culture. Well, thank you, Jason. It's wonderful to be here. I, I'm just happy to, to see how the, the, the show has grown, but also um, some of the interesting people that I know very well that you've had on the show uh, are, are just really, it's fun to watch. So, and that, and, and you're a great, always have been a great uh, interviewer for people. So I'm happy to be here today. I appreciate that, Mark. Yeah. We spent a couple of times together on stage and, uh, we have. <laughs> and, uh, and so now we're on, we're on a different stage uh, yeah. with some interesting topics. So let's start with the alternative universe that we live in today. Uh, I've drove by some uh, Chevy stores last week in Detroit. Amazingly, not a single car on the lot, not one. Uh, it's good for snow plowing the, the parking lot or for restriping. Uh, but at some locations, they even had crosstown rivals and competing makes as used cars, obviously, in this, in this strange world. You can't test one. You can't sit in one. You can't open the doors. In some cases, you can't have heated seats. It's needless to say, we never thought we would see this day. So where are we today when you take stock, if you will, no pun intended, of the stock? Well, I think, you know, um, this has been, you know, two plus years and uh, it's remarkable. I mean, who would have thought? Uh, but I think, you know, uh, if you think about the dealers um, that we have, uh, it's a huge competitive advantage. And, you know, you look at their adaptability and they're in it uh, to please our customers and, uh, you know, uh, drive sales, but also the service piece of it. So those relationships, I would say, are very much intact. And I was just shopping for a blazer actually the other day for my daughter. And so I got a good first firsthand look at this on a very current basis. And, you know, I looked um, for a white blazer within 300 miles of my zip code, you know, when I looked at the inventory, <laughs> there was only a couple, but um, the, the neat thing is, is, you know, the online uh, shop click drive experience that we've developed over this time frame enables the dealer to actually sell into the pipeline and see uh, very transparently, what's going to be built, what's built, and what the status is of that unit as it comes. So, um, you know, many of the things that I can see on the internet as coming as in transit, if you will. In fact, they're selling those as they come uh, become available. So, they've adapted in a very, uh, very cool way. And and you know the 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 dealer retail model. Um, that that we're really going to market with is is very much digital, and it allows people to buy cars any way they want. So if you want to go in and see the you know see the car before you buy it and it's in transit, you can do that. Um, you can buy it online, completely online, if you want to do that. And so you know we've got all kinds of different customers and all kinds of different ages and all kinds of different demands um, for how they want to do that. And so what we're rolling out really addresses that. But I got to give our dealers credit over this time, right? It's been tremendous. They've done a great job. Yeah, indeed. Never uh, could have imagined um, the pull forward that the business model would be able to achieve. Some have said that, in fact, getting to the point where car dealerships can operate more as, uh, as an Amazon-like experience. In other words, I'm going to click and I'm going to order and it's going to arrive, obviously, um, within a certain time frame, would never have been achieved, even in a decade without the chip shortage. Do you concur? Is this I the full forward the industry actually, needed? Yeah, yeah. we actually uh, did something um, that was a Cadillac build to order. And this was, uh, you know, decades ago. And we really tried to centralize the pool for the most popular combinations of color, price, and equipment for Cadillacs. Um, this is quite a while ago, but I, I remember it very well. And we really tried to do that so that people could actually, you know, order, the, the order to delivery piece of this would be very short. The dealer wouldn't have to um, pay the floor plan it necessarily. Um, and so all of those things on a cost basis were really good. And we would give someone um, in a very short time frame the car they exactly wanted to. But it never really materialized because we couldn't get that pipeline on a logistics basis and on a digital basis, you know, internet and everything else has happened since then. We couldn't get that really right on a timely basis. So, you know, um, I agree. Uh, this, this time frame has been golden to really look at, you know, what people really want and be able to address it. There are many people out here uh, wondering 
when the chip shortage situation is going to alleviate. I know that that's a difficult question for you, probably a very difficult answer, but GM is launching a strategy that will reduce the number of unique microcontroller units required by 95% in order to streamline some of that hardware and software advancements. And we're going to talk a lot about software today because of the electric vehicle push that's going on. But I'm guessing that that kind of agreement and drawing from three families of chips put together by partnerships between you and various suppliers is probably going to alleviate the situation faster than you might have anticipated. Is that is that accurate? It is accurate, and you know we're we're, we're designing in uh, to our next gen here. You know, ver- just just three families, and so if yeah. you think about that, and all the different variations we have across all the different vehicles we make for uh, all the different brands across the world, um, that's a powerful, uh, a very powerful model that we can implement because you know, as you know, it, it costs billions of dollars to capacitize um, any kind of microchip capacity for automobiles, and in fact. You can't. Not any one maker can get that kind of volume off of, um, you know, off of a, of a plant, which is why you don't see automakers trying to vertically integrate that. This uh, enables, uh, you know, working with, you know, seven plus suppliers. Our volume will be so high off of those three families that we can actually have, um, you know, a very stable and diverse supply base for a very few uh, different kinds of, of, of chips that we're going to do. So yes, it changes that equation uh, of incredibly. It, it, it's, a, it's a landmark uh, deal for us. GM has been very public about its goal to double revenue by 2030. You have said before, the industry is changing. This is a sea change. And you have said this could be the real tipping point of when GM gets to scale, value, and accessibility for everyone. This is a transformative time in your lifetime, and you get to be a part of it. That's got to be an amazing feeling. It's an amazing feeling, and I can tell you, don't don't leave off the the autonomous vehicle piece of this, uh, mm-hmm. Jason, because you know we've we've done over six hundred driverless rides um, and and more than twenty thousand fully driverless miles. So, you know that piece of it is is incredible as well. I did that you know a couple of weeks ago out out at uh, cruise at midnight. But, you know, if you look at um, what we did EBIT-wise this last calendar year, we did about um, $14.3 billion. And we did, uh, did that on top of a, a $127 billion in revenue. And this is, you know, the demand is so high for um, everything that we have. And, and the margin piece of this on 11.3% was, um, was really good as well. That's without the volume that we normally have. And so if you look at the volume piece of this and you look at our EV, can, you know, transformation that's happening right now. You know, our Hummers are 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 over are probably seventy percent of the people that are doing reservations on Hummers are people that are new to GM. That's growth. Hmm. And we've got another, um, uh, you know, and that's that's really fifty nine thousand people um, so far as of January thirty first, and then another one hundred ten thousand um, retail and fleet on Silverado. And another thirty thousand on Bright Drop. Those are things we don't have today, and we're about ready to open the reservation and order system on Lyric as we go into production. So, if you look at this and the transformation of this, it is it is like nothing I've ever been part of. Um, I've been around since nineteen eighty six at GM, and uh, I know it's, it's hard to say, but anyway, <laughs> I can't believe it. Uh, yeah, but I, I've never uh, I've never been so excited to be part of it. It's uh, as an engineer as well. You, you know, it just um, it's just every day is just so awesome. It really is. Well, well, and look at all of the things that you've been through since 1986, yeah. and we don't have to go back far in time to think about where we were in um, in in the last part of the last decade. Yep. And to go from that point to where we sit today with all of those targets in front of you, with a wholesale transforma- transformation of the product portfolio, with a, with a dip in the toe into autonomous, y- you must take a moment at certain stages and sit back and think, this is remarkable what's changing and where you've been. Yeah, it, I mean, you know, we, we you know, uh, as an OEM and, and as a, a fairly large OEM, um, we, we, we crank products, right? And, and we, do, uh, we, we do lots of really cool things technology-wise inside of those products. But, you know, as we move towards a, a different regulatory environment and a different 
um, value on saving and, and preserving uh, the world we live in um, for our, our children. You know, uh, this is the time, right? This is the time when we can make an, an unbelievable impact. Um, you, you saw our announcement in Michigan, you know, $7 billion, um, 4,000 plus jobs. I mean, if, if this doesn't excite you uh, on the transformation, we're doing this in, in factories largely, except for the self factories we're actually building, but largely in a lot of the footprint that we had, right? And it, like you said, you don't have to go back too far to say, um, you know, uh, you know, the whole industry is overcapacitized, right? You know, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's very different. And these are legacy car companies we're talking about. These are not startups. No. <laughs> you are no, not a not startup. Startups, yeah. No, they're not. But you're reinventing yourself. And and yeah. you get a, a, a legacy car companies get a little bit of the short shrift by Wall Street when it comes to proving that they know how to do emerging electrification. Do you <laughs> do you feel that way? You know, um, it's you know, I have a lot of frustrations with um perception and reality around that point. I really do. And um I think there's a lack of clarity and respect for what it takes to bring something. Um, that is regulated, that uh, is safe, um, that has, you know, uh, a lot of impact on people's lives, whether it's the jobs themselves or the car uh, or the truck or the SUV or the, the, uh, the CUV. And, you know, second only to a house still, right, on, on the decision of, of what you're going to buy uh, for transportation. And it's still that way. And the respect for that um, is is casual sometimes. And I listen to um, well, anybody can go make a car and, you know, you can, anybody can one, make one car and, you know, all that. And, and I give a lot of respect for the startups that um, are, are doing uh, volume production over, you know, several models. Um, I, I have a ton of respect for them, which is um, not always, uh, you know, the case where you, you get a whole bunch of money, you produce one or you try and produce one. Uh, and then you can't launch it or you can't do it on time or you can't do it the way you thought you were going to do it. Uh, it's a tough business, right? But, you know, the only thing I know is that we're going to execute and uh, we have a good track record of execution. And, you know, uh, time will tell. Why doesn't Elon Musk think that his business model is better than that of a company that's been around for more than 100 years? Why does he think that? Um, you'll probably have to ask him, but I think uh, I think uh, he's done a remarkable job. So you know, all all the the respect and and kudos to to him and 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 his company. Um, but having said that, you know, um, he he did he, when he first started making cars. I think he said that uh, you know we're, we're in manufacturing hell right now. And uh, you know, I've been there. Um, we've all been there. Uh, it's hard, uh, but. I think a business model there, you know, is, um, you know, don't forget all the legacy and all of the existing uh, vehicle makers in the industry were buying credits um, there. And, and so, you know, that, that's going to change and it is changing rapidly, I think. And you're going to have to compete uh, on a, low, a lower price point with um, a lower margin, high scale, high volume um, vehicle, if you're going to be a full service automaker, you know, to get that advantage. And so I think that's what you see us seeing when we vertically integrate our cells, our packs, and we do purpose built EVs. Uh, and I think that's a huge advantage over a long period of time. And so he's done that, but he hasn't gotten into the 25000 or $30,000 price point. And he said he wasn't going to do that recently. That's pretty tough, right? Do you admire what he's done? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I have all, all the respect and admiration uh, in, in the world for what he's done. Yeah. He certainly spent enough time throwing shade, if you will, at legacy companies. Maybe it's time for legacy companies to toss a little back Tesla's way. <laughs> you know, um, I've always, I've always, um, I've always subscribed to the deeds, not words um, school. And I still do. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Give me the elevator pitch on why GM wins in the electric car world. I think um, I think we saw over um, over the horizon here three years ago when we made the decision to not go into a stopgap of hybrids. You know, uh, hybrids are fundamentally two powertrains carried by the car that 
I'm not sure people will pay money for those two powertrains. In fact, history has shown they really haven't. And you know, you get up to maybe maybe 30 miles of EV range on that, which is is good from a you know if you if you're uh, decreasing the amount of fuel you're burning. But some of those hybrids, the way they actually operate, can be worse from a GHG standpoint. And so we went right to electric. We made that bold decision three years ago. We made the bold decision to go spend money to uh, do our own electric architectures. The reason why that's important is because um, that's a long-term strategy where you know we're going to own our, our 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 battery chemistry, our cell chemistries. We're going to own our electric motor uh, design and execution, and that's who we are as an OEM. And that's a big a big deal from a scale standpoint and a cost standpoint. And we think we can deliver things like a Silverado E, where you have a mid gate, you have um, you know a glass roof, you've got four wheel steering, air suspension, and you've got 400 miles of range. Um, those you, you can't really do that if you're retrofitting or you know taking existing architectures and putting electrification into that. And you certainly can't do it at a cost basis to deliver it with profit uh, to you know to our customers. And that's that's a big strength. I'd also say our manufacturing expertise uh, is is pretty amazing. Um, our manufacturing engineering has taken a plant like Hamtramck in Detroit converted it to, I think, the most advanced electric vehicle plant in the world and done it, you know, within a two-year period. And those, those are billions of dollars that, um, that other uh, non-legacy automakers have to spend to create or find a plant and try and understand what the plant is and then do it. And we have that mover advantage and we have it in places that, you know, can that can save billions of dollars for us in the long run on capitalization. So, you know, the other piece of it I'd say is design. Um, we know how to design from an aesthetic standpoint, vehicles that people just love. And so that's a huge competitive advantage uh, in ICE and EV. And in fact, your, your Ultium platform, just to go back to, you know, the chemistry that's at work here, it's actually, for those who don't understand, it's backward compatible uh, which is extremely important because when you start this first gen that you're just rolling out now, you can update those chemistries and backfeed those into the products as they begin to roll out, if I have that correct. That's correct. And, right. So it's not a static development. And it's important because as you look forward to future chemistries, that's that will come after that Ultium one, you're going to be able to just uh, iterate and learn and, and own, own the chemistry to be able to fuel, if you, you know, so to speak, the products. That's right. And own the, own that, that supply chain, you know, we're going to, we're going to get a lot of lithium under, under dried up lake beds in California. And so yeah. we're going to own those supply chains too, which is really important. And I, you know, I remember um, showing you the first electric vehicles to your um, staff and when you're in a yeah. different, different job and, um, and people in the, I can remember people in the room like, oh my gosh, I'm not really sure. You, you know, I'm not sure. Number one, they're serious. And I'm not sure this is the, the, the market's really going to go that way. Right. And so, um, that, that, that's, uh, you know, being able to look over that horizon is, is everything, right? You're a gasoline guy. And we're going to talk about the racing piece of this as we get into the Daytona 500 here shortly. You're a gasoline guy that is a converted electric guy. But actually, most might not know that you were an electric guy a long time ago when your dad, who was an early champion of the EV1, brought home that concept car. And as a young boy or as, as a young man, you would take it out and, and use it as a daily driver. Um, but it really laid the groundwork for where we have high volume EVs today. So this is nothing new for you. And in yeah, fact, you people, live in both worlds. I do. People have a really hard, it's really, it's a fascinating deal. People, people can't understand how I could like both. <laughs> and, you know, they really, they really connect. So thank you for recognizing that. But, you know, EV1, uh, my dad brought home one of the first um, built ones out of, um, out of the Lansing Craft Center at that time. And he brought it home. I thought, oh my gosh, this is like, I, I want to work for the company that makes this car that this is the future right this is the future it's just like you know a corvette or something that had that same like uh i don't know what it was but it, it just captured me um still i think one of the world's most aerodynamic vehicles ever produced and um it was it was a purpose built you know the, it first it started off with the um, lead acid and then went to uh, nickel nickel metal hydride 
but we did that. And that car, driving that car was fast, was zero to 60, about eight seconds. It was totally usable, right? I mean, totally usable. And the first time I drove it, I drove it up to, now this is really funny. I remember when Blockbuster Videos was 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 the thing, like you oh, go that up thing. a minute of right. movie, right? <laughs> you go rent a movie. So me and my dad um, uh, drove up there and I, I got to drive it. And it was, you know, I, I remember it to this day. It, I was dead, dead. This is like, this is it. You know, the tires, the rolling resistance, the right hand, it was like, it was absolutely perfect. And uh, so, yeah, no, I, 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 I love, I love this stuff, right? I really do. It, it's so great. It's, and you can do both. Yeah, you can do both. Um, let's talk about product. I know this is a huge passion for you. Um, when we look at what's coming on the EV side, I, I imagine that your excitement level for vehicles like the Lyric or the or the Hummer or the Symbolic or the Celestic uh, Escalade EV is off the charts. Am I correct on that? What What are we going to see, Mark? <laughs> Um, I think, you know, the, the, the Escalade is, is number one in segment number one, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but, you know, first and foremost, it's our flagship for Cadillac and it's got all the advanced technology from augmented reality to, you know, um, all the things that you might expect on a big OLED screen that we, we have in the car. I think you're going to see this taken to the next step. I think you're going to see, um, some innovation, um, I, I can't give all, all of that away, but I would say there's going to be um, things that, um, you know, an ICE Escalade can't quite do. And so if you look at our, our propulsion and you look at the dynamics and you look at the package and you look at what it delivers from a technology standpoint in the interior, uh, I think you're going to see the next step of what Cadillac can really do. And I think the Celestic, um, when we when we debut that or show the world here this next year, uh, is gonna is gonna preview a lot of that, Jason, um, that yeah. you'll see in the Escalade as well. So, you know, the Celestic, uh, you'll see the design cues um, happening first in um, in the Lyric, and then as the EVs for Cadillac roll out, um, it will be built around you know our statement car, uh, Celestic and Escalade. So, yeah. and so if we talk hypothetically here things that I see, things that internal combustion engines can't do. What are things that internal combustion engines can't do that electric can do? <laughs> well, um, I think you're, you're, you're limited from a, um, let me just say that the Escalade V that we're, we're, we're introducing right now, you know, that's a, that's a really fun car to drive, but you know, it's a different kind of car because, uh, it uses a lot, it will use a lot of fuel, for instance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the 800 volt deal we got in our battery electric truck platforms were made uh, for a performance type variant. And so you'll see, uh, see things uh, performance wise that you, you almost may only have seen in a V series ICE vehicle uh, on an Escalade or, or a car, but you'll see those now um, begin to, to get into the mainline vehicles. So um, that's, that's one area. Yeah. I, thank you for the hint. The C8 Z06 could not be hotter than it is today. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, the, the passion yeah. for this vehicle, and, and I know that uh, serial number one just went to uh, former show guest, Mr. Rick Hendrick it did. Uh, recently. Yeah. Um, for what 3.5 million? Do I have that correct? 3.6, yeah, 3.6. 3.6 million. Really, yeah, and it went to a great cause, you know. So, yep. um, yeah, really nice. Tell me, tell me about the Z06 and where can the Corvette brand go going forward? Yeah, great question. Um, the Z06, we, uh, the last time we were in the car right before we went into the production calibrations was in Germany in October. And so we had sort of the, the 100% Cal. Pretty much there, uh, driving it uh, at the uh, north course uh, of the Nurburgring, and you know we take most of our performance cars there, but that car on that track was like nothing else um, I had I had ever experienced. Uh, it was it was almost like it was on rails, and um, and the engine piece of it obviously is something that we're you know we decided a few years back that we wanted to go back to a naturally aspirated flat plane crank. Uh, engine, you know, 8,500 RPM, um, just, you know, back to what some of the roots of Z06 were in the early days. 
you know, high spinning, uh, naturally aspirated and wonderful sounds. We did not have the sound right, um, you know, towards the end of the development. Uh, so we really worked hard. Um, our, our engineers did a phenomenal job. And in fact, if you take and drop that exhaust system out of the back of that car, you could make an incredible piece of art for your home out of it. It's that good. <laughs> so it's uh, they did an incredible job. And you know, we all start stopped and 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 listened to the car. We went to the proving grounds. There's a couple places in Milford where you can actually hear the car going up a hill, coming down a hill, and going around a turn. And they said, this is just not capturing what we need. Um, and they got it. They nailed it and uh, really proud of them. And so, you know, every piece of the, the car is uh, visceral and, and feedback driven, uh, but you, it's, you know, still a Corvette. You can drive it every day, be very comfortable. You don't have to turn all that on if you don't want to, but boy, is it fun. Holy smokes, just unbelievable. You know, uh, conversations about Zora or King of the Hill, a thousand horsepower, things like that. How big can this get for Corvette? Um, from a, from a performance standpoint, mm -hmm. I think, I think, uh, you know, we, we ran out of room on architecture basis on the front engine car, which is why we went, one of the big reasons why we went to the mid engine, we knew we had to do that. I think there's more, um, I think there's more performance left in this platform, uh, with some other things from, uh, an ability to get, uh, power to the ground. And so we're, 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 we're just now um, really uh, engineering developing that. So there's more to come. More to come on that. Let's talk Buick. Is there an electrified place in Buick's lineup as well? Oh, I think so. Absolutely. You know, Buick, if you look back, don't forget, uh, we had an Electra. Remember that car? <laughs> so, Which you have recently trademarked, I think. Trademarked again. that. Yeah, we did. So anyway, um, yes, there is. Uh, and, you know, it's 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 largely an, an an SUV brand uh currently and it's it's gone very well you know it's it's still our most pro one of our most profitable channels in 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 the company between uh the the, the Buick GMC channel so we we are reaching a very different um audience it's 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 largely in, in fact i think it's the highest female um buyer brand in in the united states maybe the world but it, it's really good uh and so we've got a lot of momentum there and you know, carrying beauty and electrification is is really important uh, for Buick. And so I think more to come. But if you look at the market where um, you know in, in in China, for instance, where where Buick is is large and has been for for decades, um, that that regulatory environment is is tougher um, than what it is in the United States from a time standpoint. And so you'll see um, electric vehicles, I think, in Buick there that are made there for that market. And then I think you'll see some of those um, uh, coming to the, the, the United States market as well uh, as portfolio entries here. And so, you know, we'll see that and we'll see it at the right time. And, we'll, you know, you'll see um, a, a really good development uh, of Buick as it builds out the electrification piece of it. So let's stay with electrification, but shift to racing. With electrification, is there a chance to test some uh, possibilities on the track using that kind of powertrain, or or are we going to be gas powered for a long, long time? I think I think you're going to see um, a a very um, significant time frame of hybridization um, uh, because and, and there's lots of reasons for that. You know, we see Formula E obviously, um, which is all electric. Uh, the battery and the energy den density there requires either um, you know a series somehow to be able to change battery packs or change cars, which, you know, that's all possible. But the hybridization piece of it is really interesting from an engineering and fan standpoint. And so I think you'll see series going to, um, uh, you know, hybrid, hybrid model where they still have the noise and the fun that internal combustion engines bring, but they, they bring a, a very high tech um, traction based experience where teams and, and drivers can choose to use where they can um, activate it or not. And it'll change the fuel strategies, it'll change everything. And I think that's really interesting. I think it's pretty cool. I think you'll see that as a, as a pretty, pretty significant midterm step um, for just about every series. When could we see that in NASCAR? What's the in time NASCAR, frame? Yeah, you probably have to ask NASCAR and Steve Phelps, but you know, we, uh, <laughs> They're very interested in it, and so so are the makers. So you know, um, I don't think it's ten years from now. Uh, yeah, 
So, okay. Yeah. Within 10 years. And it, of course the rationalization, the rationalization and argument for anything that you do in auto racing is, is that technology transfer and marketing, right? Prove the technology on, on the track, transfer Absolutely. it to product on the showroom floor, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. So ergo, that's probably what we're going to see anyway. Right, Mark? I think so. And you, you look at the uh, sort of the, what we call mechatronics, which are the mechanical systems that have electric control. There's tons of opportunity for just that, Jason. And, you know, t people tend to think of, you know, a powertrain, a block, uh, an injection system. But in fact, the real artwork is going to, you're going to see um, on the transfer of technology will in fact be in uh, the control systems for these that we um, are learning how to do as we transform into electric vehicles for retail and fleet. Um, the racing piece of that will be a place where we can actually try things um, traction control wise we do today, um, steering wise we do today. But I think that integration of um, those electrified propulsion systems, whatever they are and whatever series is a huge place where we will see um, track to, to showroom uh, and a very good, uh, good relationship there. Daytona 500 coming up soon. How excited are you about the next gen vehicle? I know, you know, there's only been one exhibition with the clash recently at the LA Coliseum, but um, yeah, what are you looking forward to? I tell you, I, I was looking forward to just, you know, we've, we've been in development, all, all of the makers have been um, with NASCAR for, for a little while now, but, you know, seeing the, the, the car this last weekend at the Coliseum on TV, it looked great, um, didn't it? the car looks, looks great, yeah, it looks right? Really I mean, great. it really does. And they've done so many things. I have to give them a ton of credit because it's like they um, they have a a fearless move forward attitude with uh, reinventing what the sport is uh, on a continual basis and continual improvement. And so I think you'll see it in this gen of the car and seeing it in Daytona will be really, really good because you'll see how the car does on drafting an arrow side by side. You'll see how it does drafting, um, you know, uh, tip to toe, but you'll also see um, how, how the fuel economy works. You'll see uh, people in pit row changing tires with a single nut. You'll see uh, really cool dashboards. You'll see all that great stuff. Um, and the cars, you know, they just look fantastic. And, and so I'm looking forward to every piece of that. And NASCAR, these aren't small changes. NASCAR has done um, a, a really thorough job of thinking out what those changes mean to all the teams, um, the owners, the drivers, and then the fans, uh, most importantly. So it's a fan, a fan customer-driven change that we'll see at Daytona, and I think it's very exciting. Steve Phelps, obviously just on the show recently, uh, is going through his own transformation, much akin to the General Motors transformation. I mean, he is reinvigorating NASCAR. You've watched NASCAR for a long time. I think you would concur. This is a wholesale change for the sport, isn't it? Oh, it is, you know, and there, like I said, you know, it takes courage. Um, and, and, and so Steve and, and the whole team, you know, Mike, Mike Helton, uh, Jim France, uh, Lisa Kennedy, um, they, they are really dialed in to, for the long haul and, and committed and have a lot of courage and they know, you know, there'll be some mistakes made as any transformation. And any, anytime you have, you're managing large scale change, like they are, there'll be some mistakes. They'll correct. They'll be agile. And, and they'll get back to work and fix those. And that's what it takes to, to be successful. And, and whether it's the track they choose, like, you know, the Coliseum, that's an experiment, right? That is a really yeah. cool, that's yeah. very cool. And, uh, and so they're going to keep doing that stuff. And that's what makes the sport interesting and great. And, you know, kudos. Mark, you're a collector. You collect cars from your past and you've been known to drive a Holden down Woodward <laughs> Avenue for the <laughs> Detroit Dream Cruise. Maybe aside from the C8 Corvette, what vehicles in today's GM portfolio do you see as obvious collector cars in the future? Yep, I think, um, I, well, I just bought one, uh, Jason, and uh, I sold uh, two cars to, to get it, but, um, and I'll keep my cars forever. I, I, I like to redo cars and I like to experience driving them and then I, 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 uh, I move on, right? Because there's so many that I want to, on experience, but I, I just bought one that I'm going to keep for a long time. And it's a, a, a CT5 Blackwing, uh, mm. Cadillac Blackwing. And, you know, this, this, uh, this will kind of be the last gen of the, the, you know, the V internal combustion engine. 
car. Um, and so I want one and I'm going to keep that for a long time. So uh, that that's very special uh, what I have sitting in my garage and I got it. So the, the weather changed. So I only have 340 miles on it. So I got to get it to that 500 mark so I can, uh, so, you know, everything changes. The, 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 the engine's formally broken in. So you get the, the higher red line and all that stuff. So but that, that's, that's one of them. I think, um, I think the the Hummer first edition will be something people, you know, see um, as sort of the first Ultium um, in the transformation. And I think, you know, frankly, the Cadillac Lyric will be the first, um, you know, electrification tip of the spear for General Motors and Cadillac. And I think that'll be something that people hang on to as, as well. Will autonomous cars be collector cars, the first ones out of the gate, much like the EV1 was its own ground groundbreaking product? I do. I think it will when we move into the retail environment there and we collaborate more, um, you know, to make a car that people can actually buy um, off of the rideshare origins. But I think, um, you know, the Henry Ford, I'm on, on the board there, and we have a, one of the first cruise bolts, if you will, um, sitting in the Henry Ford. So um, that's certainly a landmark car like EV1. And I think, um, you know, those, those origins and the first retails will, will, will definitely be. As we move toward autonomous vehicles that drive us around, how do you differentiate the ride experience from those of other transportation companies? How does it become a uniquely GM autonomous vehicle? That's a great question. I think, um, I think the customer experience is where Kyle and the team is really focusing. And when I say that, it's, it's sort of like, well, what does that mean? What does he mean by, by that, right? Well, if you look at um, the development of um, the cruise that I drove the other night, uh, its name was Disco, by the way, which was, I took a lot right. of flack. That, so <laughs> cool. Which, um, by the way, you, you described the experience as mind-blowing, is what you said. I, I did, I did. And, and the reason why I said that is because, yeah. um, you know, first you're watching, you're sitting in the back of that car and you're watching um, the, the car do all this. But secondly, um, I spend a lot of time in cars making sure that customers will feel good in a car uh, and feel like the car is well integrated, it's comfortable, it's what they, they want and it's what they like to drive. This car um, went from, we really had a tough development of making the car from a pleasability standpoint, intuitive and expected um, if you rode in the car, not, not drove the car, but if you rode in the car. And so um, I think they have done so many things that have done that uh, from a jerkiness. And, and I'm talking about how you apply a brake. Is it linear? Um, is it... Uh, as you go around the corner, are you expecting the vector of the turn to be what the car does instead of doing this or doing this or doing that? Um, and so, you know, if I Uber or I, um, I, I you know, take a, a lift or, or whatever that is, or I have a, I'm driven by something, you know, and I pay for the ride, it's not as good as the car um, that I was in uh, the other night at, at Cruise. That's a big deal. And so there's that. And then there's the origin piece as we go into production that was extremely well thought out in terms of, you know, people who have just, you know, are disabled that need to use that service. How does that work? The floor is low. The, you know, all of those little things are the screens in the right places that intuitive as it drives up and it says that it's unlocking and the doors are opening and when they close and do you have your safety belt, all those little things um, for the customer uh, and not, uh, getting sick driving, um, you know, uh, rearward. We drove in an origin out of the proving grounds, um, and you know, it, you you don't. And it's because of the dynamics. It's because of how the car behaves. That's a big differentiator. So much technology, so much innovation going on at General Motors, and you're a second generation GM executive. And you and I have talked before about uh, your father, Lloyd. Uh, how often do you talk business with him, and uh, how do you think that that makes him feel? You know, um, after we made these announcements, um, I went over to visit him uh, and I took him, you know, the paper, he's 85. Okay, so I took him um, the papers, you know, that described what we were doing. And I, take, I took him a book that we uh, made about the lyric, uh, which was, you know, really, really amazing. And then I, I, I take him things and um, he looks at it and he just can't believe it, you know. And uh, there was a great thing done by Automotive News that, that you guys did with, you um, on my dad and myself on EV1. And, you know, 
it brought back all kinds of memories because the red EV1s were, you know, that sticks in his mind as, you know, sort of the first. And it was. And now he said, I can't believe this is happening, Mark. I cannot believe that you guys are all doing uh, what we knew was going to happen. Um, but now it's happening. The world's ready for it, right? It was in your driveway. <laughs> it was in my driveway. I know. I know. I know. And so he's, uh, I think he's, um, I, I know he's uh, just can't believe it, right? Which is really cool that he gets to be able to, to see it. So very thankful. It's fair to say that you and CEO Mary Barra, you're betting GM's future on the success of electric vehicles. And I know that when you've been asked that, you have said it's a well-calculated bet, but we always bet our future on our company. I was going to say, that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. You always bet the future on the company. Um, you've made so much, so much progress in terms of cutting down development times, uh, coming up with new models, not only powertrains, but, but you know, different ways of going to market, obviously now getting into battery development. But during COVID, you, you compared what occurred in the, over the last two years to the World War II arsenal of democracy. And the fact that the speed that you worked at in order to get ventilators produced and the government contract fulfilled, a Herculean task. Now you describe everything that you do within the company as the ventilator speed. That's right. So you're on ventilator speed now over we the course of the next week, aren't you? Yeah, we are. And, you know, it's amazing because we were standing in the dome the other day looking at, you know, the showrooms um, of, of some of our brands with physical models. And Michael Simcoe said, you know, Mark, he said, every, every car sitting in this dome was done in a pandemic. And that, that's a pretty big statement, right? Wow. Yeah. So... We've got great people. We really do. We've got, you know, close to, I don't know, 65% of the company has five years or less, um, which is, you know, pretty amazing, which is really great. Um, and so, you know, you see the transformation in the company too, software wise um, and hardware wise, you know, uh, it's a different deal. And uh, I couldn't be more excited because, you know, you do something like ventilators or you do something like masks or you do something like all the things we did. Um, during the, the the first months of the pandemic, and you feel and you see how excited people are to to take a you know pretty lofty goal, do it, and then come back for more because it's it's exhilarating, right? And I think that that's that's part of the DNA of the company now. I really do. You're president of one of the world's largest consumer product companies. Do you have obligations to future generations? Wow, that's a great question. You know, um, I take my job very seriously, and I think I think that's um, that's always been part of who I am and why I'm doing and why I stayed at this company um, because I know um, what the impact is um, for people to be able to put food on the table, um, to educate their kids, um, to live a good life, uh, and and to give back. And I think there's there's huge obligations um, around that. And, you know, everybody will make mistakes, but, you know, we try and really, really hold in high, high regard um, what the next generation is going to be, who it's going to be. Um, I never want this company left the way it was left um, post, you know, post financial crisis um to to anybody else and so we're going to have the right people uh in line we're going to have uh the right people with the right experiences in line we're going to have product plans and capacity plans um that are robust uh and we're, we're, we're growing the company we're already growing the company back and so i think that's um the future and you know uh you don't come to work if you don't, I don't, I can't come to work. Um, if, if it's all about, you know, some sort of paycheck or some sort of thing that, you know, um, that, that is self-centered on, on wealth or, um, or, or, or something like that. that, that's, that's not it. It never was, um, you know, we lost everything as we went through this financial crisis and, you know, I'm paid very well, but I'm paid very well to make sure that we have this thing in the right place with the right people uh, in a very passionate way.
And so that's what we're doing. Heartfelt thoughts, poignant thoughts. Mark Royce, thank you so much for being with me on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Jason. It's always a pleasure.